as a meeting place. The mediation had the blessing of Switzerland's foreign minister, Micheline Kalmi Ray. She gave the task of doing the mediation work to Michael Ambuel, who was the state secretary for foreign affairs at the time. Mr. Ambuel was very helpful to me in uh, performing research related to this publication. Uh, after that initial meeting in May, there was a follow-up meeting in Grisense in July and then again in September. At the end of September, the foreign ministers of Turkey and Armenia met at the General Assembly, also with Swiss facilitation. Back to Grisense in October of that year, a meeting in Bern in December of 2009, in Davos uh, in January. Excuse me, the Bern meeting was... Uh, January 2009, and then Davos was later that month, and then finally at the Munich Security Summit in February of 2009. Meanwhile, Ambuel and his team were drafting the protocols, exchanging documents, preparing concept papers that really form the basis upon which the protocols themselves and the annexes were based. The documents were initialed by Turkish and Armenian officials on the 2nd of April, and then on the 6th of April, President Obama, just 77 days after being inaugurated uh, as a testimony to Turkey's importance in US foreign policy, made a visit to the uh, Alliance of Civilizations. Uh, part of his agenda included sealing the deal between Turkey and Armenia. At the time, there was no discussion about the procedural break breakthrough in the protocols, which was the fact that nowhere in the text nor in the annex was there any mention of the Nagorno-Karabakh conflict. Uh, I remember sitting with Dan Freed, who was Assistant Secretary at the time, and he was gleeful about the procedural breakthrough. You know, clearly, the opportunity to reaffirm the delinkage by President Obama when he met with Gul and Erdogan was a missed opportunity. The announcement of the protocols did not occur after their initialing. Uh, there were delays in making the announcement. Uh, of course, there are different interpretations as to the reasons for those delays. Uh, the Armenians insist that the Turks would not allow the document to re be released. But finally, with the facilitation of Vice President Biden, there was an announcement about the protocols on the 22nd of April. Uh, as you can imagine, the, the, the protocols were met with a firestorm of controversy in both countries. Armenians criticized them for selling out international recognition of the Armenian genocide. The timing of the announcement just two days prior to Genocide Remembrance Day was pointed to by opponents of the government and the Dashnaks as evidence of this. Likewise, there was an equal controversy in Turkey because of the uh, speculation that there was no linkage to Nagorno-Karabakh and uh, the AKP-led government was accused of selling out their Turkic brethren in Azerbaijan. Uh, there were months of haggling over the cover sh sh document to which the protocols would be attached when they were formally released to the public. And I had the chance to go through some of the email exchanges uh, between the Swiss and US and Turkish and Armenian officials about this. And I would say that all the parties negotiated too hard over small details. The delay in actually releasing the protocols gave rise to a lot of speculation, as I just mentioned. They weren't finally published until the 31st of August. The speculation about a joint history commission to determine the veracity of, uh, quote, allegations of the Armenian genocide um, was laid to rest. The language in the annex was very explicit. It called on the implementation of a dialogue on, his, on the historical dimension as a way of building confidence. Ambul refers to the diplomatic engineering in the text, the sequencing of events, the clear definition of roles and responsibilities, the timing under which certain steps would be taken as a very essential element in the agreement itself. Uh, some time also passed until there was a formal signing ceremony, which was scheduled at the university in, in Zurich on October 10th of 2009. Uh, there was an agreement to exchange texts of the statements that were to be made. Uh, the foreign ministers 
of Russia, France, Mr. Solanov representing the European Commission were all, president, were all present in the AUL. When at 4.30, just 30 minutes prior to the signing ceremony, the Turkish text was provided to Foreign Minister Nalbandian, he made it very clear that he would not be attending, that he would not be signing. Uh, apparently, and there's some speculation based on different interviews, the text referred to a history commission evaluating the credibility of Armenian claims. Some also have said that it referred to a linkage with resolution of Nagorno-Karabakh. Uh, there are different renditions of what happened during that three-hour period from 5 p.m. when the signing was scheduled to when Mr. Nobanian finally arrived at the University of Zurich. But at 8 p.m., the signing occurred. There were no statements from any of the parties concerned. Uh, there was a rather bland and innocuous statement from Micheline Kalmi Ray. Afterwards, there was a dinner. Uh, Hillary Clinton, as you may recall, was dressed in a bright, bright blue pantsuit. She stayed for cocktails and then got on her plane and left. So it was clear from the 11th hour drama that the protocols were in trouble even before they were signed. Uh, then came the question of ratification. Despite the diplomatic engineering that the Swiss boast about, there was no deadline for which the protocols must be signed. Um, Assistant Secretary Phil Gordon made clear that you can't have a process that drags on forever. There was a lot of effort made uh, by the facilitators in Switzerland and others to get ra the ratification done. Uh, but it was clear that things were not moving forward. The debate over the constitutional court in Armenia and its finding, uh, which concluded that the protocols did not contradict the Declaration of Independence or the Constitution of Armenia that referred to Western Armenia and the state of Armenia's dedicated purpose to gain international recognition of the genocide was used by the Turkish side to walk back their commitment. At the nuclear security summit here in Washington, the US made a last ditch diplomatic effort to bring Prime Minister Erdogan and uh, President Sarkisian together. Uh, they had a stiff meeting over 90 minutes. There was little agreement and little progress. Uh, that occurred on the 12th of April, 10 days later. President Sarkisian addressed the nation in Armenia and suspended Armenia's signature on the protocols. Uh, when I met with US officials during the nuclear summit, they said they had a plan B. It seems that that plan B was to get a suspension rather than to have Armenia withdraw its signature. The net effect was the same, progress towards ratification of the protocols uh, after Sarkisian's statement was essentially suspended. On the 4th of July, uh, Hillary Clinton made a visit to Yerevan. She visited the Armenian Genocide Memorial there, and she stated very clearly US policy and the prevalent international view that, quote, the ball is in Turkey's court. And so it remains as we gather today to talk about the history that brought us to that moment and where we are now and what we can do in the future. In any diplomatic process, there are heroes and there are villains and there are goats. And uh, let me be very clear and candid with you in sharing my view of who fits into those different categories. The heroes here, to my mind, are President Gould, who initiated the contact by writing President Sarkeesian when he won his election, of having the courage and the vision to go to Yerevan for the World Cup match. President Sarkeesian for inviting him, for withstanding domestic political criticism, for having him in country. The professional diplomats on both the Turkish and the Armenian side developed a good personal rapport and conducted themselves uh, with transparency and in constructive fashion throughout. I think that uh, particular praise is due to Ambassadors Apakan and Chevikos and uh, 
acting foreign minister uh, Armin Kirikosian, who initiated the negotiations and then stayed with them until Mr. Nalbandian was named foreign minister also deserves high praise, as do members of his team. Uh, Secretary Clinton got personally involved, investing American prestige and concluding the deal was important. Uh, and the mediation that she and Phil Gordon did in Zurich really saved the protocols from being thrown under the bus then and there. Uh, let me be just as candid about identifying those who played a less constructive role. And uh, at the top of that list is Prime Minister Erdogan. Uh, just as the protocols were being initialed on the 2nd of April, he was giving a speech trying to relink resolution of uh, the Nagorno-Karabakh conflict with normalization between Turkey and Armenia. Uh, much to the shock and surprise of his foreign ministry, he went to Baku and gave a speech there on the 13th of May in which he made it crystal clear that Turkey would never normalize until all, quote, occupied territories in Azerbaijan had been returned to Azeri control. This was raising the bar. The discussions of the Minsk group at the time were focusing on specific rayons, not all territories. Uh, in March of 2010, he gratuitously and insultingly threatened to deport Armenians living illegally in Turkey. And then later that year, ordered the destruction of a Turkish-Armenian friendship statue on the border and called it a freak. You know, these steps, to me, demonstrate ill will towards the process and a lack of desire to get the deal done. I would also include in the category of those who played a less constructive role, Azerbaijan's President Ilham Aliyev. When the protocols were announced, he threatened to suspend gas sales to Turkey, and then he jacked up the price of those sales. Uh, Foreign Minister Babajan had made four trips to Baku, so the Azeris were kept fully in the loop. American diplomats also kept Azerbaijan informed, as did the Swiss. It's my view that uh, Mr. Ali had just never believed that the deal would go forward. And when it was announced, he was shocked by that and reacted rhetorically in a fashion that was not conducive to either the uh, realization of the protocols or resolution of the NK conflict. Uh, he postponed the Shah Deniz project until 2017 as a setback for Nabucco with direct bearing on Turkey's investment. And his constant and increasingly vocal war calls over Nagorno-Karabakh uh, needlessly exacerbated tensions. Uh, when I think about goats in this process, um, I think first about President Medvedev and Foreign Minister Lavrov, who uh, at Kazan thought they had a deal with Azerbaijan to revitalize the Minsk group through agreement on a set of principles. Uh, when the Azeris showed up, they essentially dissed the Russians, creating a huge embarrassment for Mr. Lavrov and Medvedev. So clearly, Russia overestimated its influence. I'd say put also in the goat category, Foreign Minister Davidolu, who, uh, when he came into his office, boasted about a policy of zero problems with neighbors. And uh, during his tenure, uh, Turkey has seen only problems exacerbate on all of its borders, and a missed opportunity in Armenia to resolve a problem that is clearly of great concern to Armenians around the world and to the international community. As long as I'm being uh, generous in my criticism, let me also offer criticism of American diplomacy. Uh, when President Obama met with Gul and Erdogan on the 6th of April, failing to reaffirm the delinkage with Nagorno-Karabakh was a very critical opportunity missed. There were poor communications between the embassies in Ankara and in Yerevan. I remember in February, of 2009, sitting with Jim Jeffrey at his residence, and he was telling me that he didn't think that these protocols would get ratified. The next day, I had breakfast with Marie Ivanovich in Yerevan, 
And when I relayed my concern and Ambassador Jeffrey's concern, her response was, do you really think there's a chance that these won't be ratified? So clearly there was some disconnect there, either in the reporting or the communication between the two embassies. After the protocols were signed and the Secretary of State's prestige was personally invested, the State Department bureaucratized the follow-up. They assigned it to a Deputy Assistant Secretary who had a dozen problems to deal with. At the time, I called for the appointment of a special envoy on ratification of the protocols. Uh, no such thing happened. Uh, after having gotten through Zurich, it seemed as though the United States just assumed that things would move forward smoothly, took its eye off the ball without recognizing the difficulty and actually going around the bases and getting this one done. I also wanted to um, just also reflect on Matt Bryza's role. Matt is a friend, but his uh, eternal and deep optimism in all things related to the Minsk Group created expectations among all the parties that were poorly placed. There were also failings of Armenian diplomacy. And I was very direct with Foreign Minister Nalbanian in our discussion the week before last on this matter. <clears throat> the timing of the announcement two days before Genocide Remembrance Day was a huge mistake. Of course, it would give rise to claims by Dashnaks and others that this was somehow intended to undermine genocide recognition. Uh, the fact that he acquiesced to US demands and pressure and made the announcement when he did, to me, didn't show the right kind of judgment. There was also a lack of transparency in Armenian diplomacy. Uh, there was no public diplomacy, no communication with civil society, no consultation. As Mr. Nalbandian said to me, I handled all the discussions myself. They were closely held, only a few people were aware, and I acted on the instructions of the president. It would have been better to have a more participatory and transparent process. After the Constitutional Court issued its finding, uh, it would have been easy for Armenia to make a statement reaffirming its commitment to, to Turkey's territorial integrity. After all, this has been Armenian policy for decades dating back to 1920 and 21 with the Treaty of Kars and the Treaty of Moscow. As OSCE member states, they also pledged to respect each other's territorial integrity. A statement to that effect would have gone a long way to calming some of the CHP and MHP fervor in Turkey that was mm, claiming that Armenia was looking for a piece of the rock. Uh, I'm often asked uh, why Turkey uh, conducted itself in the fashion that it did. Um, and I really don't have a authoritative answer to that. I think there was a lot of wishful thinking in Ankara. There was a belief that if you can solve the Turkey-Armenia relationship, that that would somehow catalyze a resolution of the NK conflict. I happen to personally believe that that is true, that if uh, Armenia's interests were focused to the West, that that would have changed the dynamics in the Minsk group and made for a more productive process there. Um, but diplomacy should never be based on wishful thinking. Agreements should always be measured by what they say, not on what we hope follows them. So I think both in Ankara and in Washington, there was too much wishful thinking here. I also believe that uh, Turkey underestimated the intensity of Azerbaijan's opposition. They felt that Foreign Minister J Babajan's consultations were enough and that they had neutralized opposition, or they expected some, but not the ferocious and intense opposition that ensued. And I think ultimately, Turkey never really thought that Yerevan would agree. And for them, this was just a way of winning a diplomatic show, that it's the Armenians, after all, that are responsible for lack of progress. And when the Armenians agreed, and Turkey also was put in a position where it had to make good on its commitment, uh, it uh, was greeted by a series of statements and steps by Turkish officials almost immediately walking back the commitment of Turkey as a signatory to the protocols. So um, where do we go from here? Let me see if I can be brief. There, there are uh, more ample recommendations provided in uh, the monograph. 
copies of which are here for you. When I wrote the monograph, I um, approached it, and based on my research, I had concluded that the protocols were dead. I refer to them as suspended or frozen, but that was really just diplomatic language on my part. I'd like to disassociate myself from that conclusion. Um, based on the meetings that I had recently in Turkey and Armenia, I still believe that elements of the protocols represent the way forward. I had thought that uh, given the very clear statements by Foreign Minister Davidolu and others that the dialogue and historical issues was a way to institutionalize a process of undermining claims of the genocide, that the Armenian side would never ratify if Turkey actually dusted the protocols off the shelf and decided to ratify themselves. But it's my belief now that the possibility still exists for that to happen, for the Turks to recognize that with the centennial approaching, that uh, it is in their interest to make an apology, to ratify the protocols, or to take steps short of that to through an executive order to simply establish diplomatic relations and open the border for normal travel and trade. The statement that Prime Minister Erdogan made some months ago, apologizing for what happened to the Kurds in Dersim in 1936, to me shows uh, something in his character that I didn't think he had, which was the ability to apologize. And I know from my own experience working in conflicts in the 1990s that apologizing can be kind of catching. If you apologize for something, it becomes easier to apologize for something else. So it's still my hope that as a humanitarian gesture based on Islamic principles that Prime Minister Erdogan will issue an apology for what happened to the Armenians and will submit the protocols for ratification or via executive order, normalize relations, and open the border for travel and trade. Uh, if that sounds like wishful thinking on my part, then you can take me to account in our discussions. But I think it's important to be hopeful, not optimistic, but also find ways forward. And the role that civil society plays in not consolidating an agreement, but serving as a safety net to uh, the impasse that currently exists with no contact between Turkish and Armenian officials is important. For the past couple of years, uh, Columbia University has been working with a consortium of Turkish and Armenian NGOs uh, that are meeting to look at their joint projects, to integrate them strategically. These groups are beneficiaries of a multi-million dollar US aid grant working on cross-border activities. So. Uh, those meetings should continue. The government of Sweden that's been providing funding for those implementation reviews should up the ante and instead of having mm, round tables, should have a civil society summit. I've spoken with Stockholm about that. The US government that has been providing funds through USAID should renew that grant this year. Also the US Embassy in Ankara has been providing multi-million dollar financing for Turkish and Armenian groups working together in fields like tourism and education and in media. Those projects should also continue to be the beneficiary of financing, but there needs to be a more strategic coherence between US government monies that are spent in Yerevan and in Ankara at a minimum so that the Turkish and Armenian partners working through both of those grants know what the other is doing in an era when budgets are being cut and the US is being challenged to do more with less, the administration owes it to taxpayers to spend that money prudently, but also to continue its largesse and support. Uh, there are also a bunch of different activities that universities have underway. Three Turkish universities have set up Armenian language studies programs. Those should continue. It's important that policy be based on uh, current sociological research. In 2003, we supported TESEV and an Armenian partner to do field research on perceptions of the other. It's important that that research be renewed. On the commercial end, charter flights between Van and Yerevan should be established. Tourist buses traveling from Armenia to cultural and religious sites in Turkey should be allowed to cross the border. The Black Sea Economic Cooperation Council allows 200 trucks from Armenia to transit through Turkey to destinations in third countries and vice versa. 
those lorries should be allowed to offload their products in Turkey and Armenia, and the products that they offload should include on the export registry Turkey and Armenia as their countries of origin and destination. Uh, there's opportunity to improve the railway line between cars and Gumri. There's a fiber optic cable that Turkey has that terminates in Van. Armenia has need for increased internet access, so extending the fiber optic cable is another opportunity. Turkey needs electricity to fuel its economic boom, and Armenia has an electricity surplus, so harmonizing the gauge systems between their utilities and allowing electricity sales would also be a significant step. I think, Tom, you were the first to put forward the idea of qualifying industrial zones where on the border. He was one of the few to put forward this idea of a qualifying industrial zone, a QYZ, where enterprises involving goods or manufacturing or services between Armenians and Turks, and if possible, Azeris, would qualify through congressional action for tariff-free import to the United States is a worthy concept that should be further explored. On the subject of history, I've always felt that uh, the solution to the problems between Turks and Armenians in the future do not lie in uh, some kind of historical reckoning. And when I was distributing this umbrella fund, there were lots of proposals that were brought forward to finance different kinds of historical gatherings. Uh, to my mind, uh, historians will always come to the table with lots of documentation confirming what they already know. I had the chance to go visit Bernard Lewis at his home in Princeton, and he took me into his back office, and he got up on his sort of uh, his stepladder and started pulling books off the shelf in Polish and German and all kinds of languages, saying, see, these historical records deny that the Armenian genocide ever occurred. I'm sure that Richard Hovhannisian in Los Angeles has a similar library. And if I had the opportunity to visit with him there, he would find documentation to confirm his strongly held view. I do think there is an opportunity on the history side to do some work together. Uh, rather than develop a plan for, rather than access archives, I think you could set up a joint committee of scholars to look at which archives exist, the condition of those archives, are they credible, have they been purged, and what are the procedures for accessing them? I think that you can also have a joint committee of Turks and Armenians to look at cultural and religious monuments and identify uh, how they could be renovated. Turkey spent several million dollars to rebuild the Akhtamar church, uh, but no good deed goes unpunished. They failed to put a cross at the top of the church, and as a result, it brought more condemnation than praise. Um, I support the proposal to set up a special exhibition at the Armenian Genocide Museum of, quote, righteous Turks who helped save Armenians during the deportation. Uh, there are also some recommendations for intergovernmental contact, mostly on disaster mitigation and emergency preparedness. Uh, through NATO's Disaster Response Coordinating Center, there's an opportunity for Turkish and Armenian officials to interact. I think also, uh, though diminished by the Eurozone crisis, Europe still has the luster of attraction and ultimately, Turkey and Armenia both aspire to closer ties with Europe, which makes their national frontier less important. So I recall uh, Madeleine Albright, who once said that um, reconciliation is a lot like riding a bicycle. You fall off the minute you stop pedaling. And being in touch over many years with Turkish and Armenian partners, I uh, commend their commitment to working under the most difficult conditions. The fact that they're still finding areas for contact and cooperation, even under the current impasse, vindicates the view that reconciliation is a process, whereas the signing and ratification of the protocols is an event. And I know that that bicycle ride may look like a bit of an uphill climb, but uh, based on my understanding uh, of Turks and Armenians and their commitment to trying to overcome uh, historical enmities and work together towards a brighter shared future, I remain hopeful that reconciliation can occur. And as part of that reconciliation, normalization and diplomatic relations can be established. So thank you all for your attention. Look forward to Mike's response and to all of your questions.
It's important to recognize that an incredible amount of valuable work uh, has been accomplished in the process in negotiating the protocols. And despite the disappointment and even some of the bitterness uh, that still surrounds the protocols, it is an incredible achievement for the parties uh, involved, uh, whatever its uh, near-term uh, fate. Secondly, it also builds on and complements the earlier track two, track one and a half efforts that David uh, and Tom have been so active in uh, these last number of years. Uh, and it's important, I think, in one conversation earlier, uh, recognize that the substance of the conversation uh, in Turkey and between Turks and Armenians are in a place far beyond where they were 10 years ago. That is immensely important. So that there is a lot that has already been laid in terms of a, a foundation, hopefully, uh, to take some of the steps that David lays out in his uh, way forward uh, section in the book. And I commend that to you. Now, just my own reaction to reading uh, through quite diligently uh, his report that came to me. And these are my own observations. They're private. I represent no one. By the way, uh, I recently left National Defense University, and I only serve on the Qatar Foundation International Advisory Board on Arabic. So I have no affiliation that I want to uh, pretend to. So these are my own thoughts, uh, hopefully informed by, uh, by my own experience and conversations with folks. Uh, Given the current political and other domestic and regional uh, realities, uh, it seems more productive to shift the emphasis from state to state track one efforts as represented by the protocols to broader multidimensional civil society track two efforts. And I think that's generally accepted. That doesn't mean that one discards the track one it just simply says, acknowledges at this point in time that it might not be, that it might be time for a pause. Uh, and let's look at fleshing out, broadening, deepening, uh, adding to the rich menu of track two uh, endeavors and even more uh, elements of civil society uh, that are already underway. That what they might be at fault for is not uh, following through with a process that they committed on, but by not embarking on it or not embarking on it honestly from the outset. So I wanted to get better clarity from you on that. And then briefly, in terms of moving forward, uh, we, we talk about the opening of the border and we talk about opening diplomatic relations. Do you think that there's any possibility that the, that we that that might be too much and that we could separate those two issues and perhaps uh, seek a way forward which would involve opening diplomatic relations first, but preserving the opening of the border for a later time. So the latter part of your question about both parties seeking failure, I think, is uh, a partial explanation. On both sides, I think there was a view that the other would never go forward. And by engaging in a process and bringing all of these international mediators into the game, that ultimately it would be a political win for Turkey if Armenia walked away and for Armenia if Turkey walked away. When neither walked away, both sides were confronted with difficult choices about ratification. Uh, the Armenian government always made it clear that they would ratify within 24 hours after Turkey ratified. But I think this whole discussion about ratification it, it was unnecessary. Uh, it was well within the competencies of the executives in both countries to merely sign an agreement and instruct their governments to implement it. Uh, requiring parliamentary ratification for both was a way out and provided political cover because both mm -hmm. knew that there was going to be controversy surrounding the decision. And Corey, let me just uh, see if I can answer your question about uh, for what do I take Prime Minister Erdogan to account? 
uh, for establishing a linkage with NK when there was none. When <coughs> foreign policy professionals in the, in the Turkish Foreign Ministry negotiated an agreement that explicitly excluded NK with the hope that it would get addressed in the future with what one who preferred to remain anonymous said was a gentleman agreement to handle it after normalization had occurred. But to me, the, the uh, responsibility here for scuttling the accords was the linkage that was established. There was none until Prime Minister Erdogan went to Baku and clearly established it. On your second point, bifurcating normalization and diplomatic relations, sure, why not? I think it's probably just as hard to do one as it is to do both, so why not do both? Uh, but if you can build some momentum uh, by a two-step process, then there's a lot to be said for that, too. Yeah, okay. I, uh, friend from the Turkish Embassy, do introduce yourself. Well, I'm sure has a, may have a couple of points. <coughs> Uh, my name is David from the Turkish Embassy. Uh, we would like to thank, thank you for the Turkish Embassy. Uh, we can't hear from the okay. yeah, can, can you do speak a bit louder and you can't hear? Uh, uh, I, think I, might get I would like to say that uh, we uh, fix the mic. For, uh, uh, is, is it switched on? Sorry. Uh, so we appreciate your efforts for trying to uh, draft an impartial study. And uh, there are many points we disagree with you. Uh, first of all, your study starts with an assumption of uh, uh, assumption that there was a genocide, and uh, it says that uh, there was an uh, elimination of one million uh, Armenians. And you, you know our position uh, about this, and this is the very essence of the issue. So uh, we would have expected that any impartial study would not uh, start in this way. And uh, uh, your uh, way of depicting the political situation in Turkey uh, uh, suffers from certain misrepresentations. Uh, for example, uh, Article 301. It, it's already uh, amended in 2008, and any prosecution under this article is uh, should be uh, submitted to uh, Minister of Justice. And in last year, only uh, eight applications were allowed. Anyhow, uh, and uh, uh, regarding protocols in uh, in protocols process, we understand that you are accepting that uh, it was the initiative of Turkish Minister of Foreign Affairs, and you, you quote in your, in your book uh, in certain point, and you are to also praise our president's uh, vision and statesmanship uh, in this regard. We are, we are, we are thankful to uh, that, and uh, so far uh, Turkey has uh, applied uh, many uh, unilateral gestures vis-a-vis -vis Armenia and Turkey's desires of normalizing its relations uh, with Armenia and uh, we will continue in this way. It was just a uh, comment. Right. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now we've got a lot of people so I'm just going to cut around up starting over here. Thank you, uh, Arsen Haradzian for Voice of America's Armenian Service. Thank you very much for the presentation. Um, I've actually gone through the, um, the uh, work before uh, when it just came out. Uh, two quick questions. Uh, one would be, um, can we now assume that uh, this protocol process brought uh, the Turkish Azerbaijani agenda into one more vividly? Um, just this past February when the Hojalu-related uh, demonstrations were happening in the streets of Istanbul. The Turkish Majlis issued a statement where, again, it was called uh, to uh, states one nation. And can we say that, in a way, we fueled this, uh, uh, the, 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 mm. the, say, uh, Azerbaijanis uh, pro-Turkish or 
towards Turkish direction? That's the first question. The second question is one of the biggest criticisms from the anti-protocol crowds within the Armenian context was, well, uh, even if we linked Karabakh conflict and the, um, the border opening and the diplomatic relations, the fear is that if you're going to have any sacrifices on the Karabakh front, that's suggested from the Turkish government, give us two regions, whatever, then we can talk about the progress then, but the border opening can always be closed again, and you basically are before a fact where you can't change much. So what can be, what international guarantees can there be if miraculously tomorrow the protocols are ratified and the process is going moving forward that uh, the Turkish side would not decide to suspend the diplomatic relations and close the border again? Thank you. Thank you. Um, and did you have a question? No. Okay, um, Dave, David Grigori at the back. Thank you, Tom. Uh, uh, thank you very much for very uh, useful and insightful uh, presentations. Uh, Mr. Phillips, I'm not a uh, negotiator, not an international negotiator, but having been exposed to uh, negotiations of different um, nature at, at a high level, um, including in Iraq, I, I know and I hope you agree with me that timing is important. Uh, when I look at the timing uh, when the official channel was launched, uh, what I'm seeing is a lame duck, some would argue um, an illegitimate, illegitimate president who's benefited from a fraudulent election and, and deaths of uh, March 1st and 2nd in 2008. I see an economy going through uh, the, one of the uh, deepest recessions uh, seen since the beginning of the latest crisis. And I see uh, the relations between Armenia and the diaspora, both important stakeholders in this process, at the all time low. Uh, what made the negotiators think, given this context, that the timing of launching uh, this sort of the, the official track was good? And, and, and do you think any of what I've described had anything to do with uh, where we are now? Thank you. Thank you. Um, not much time to answer some tricky questions. Let me answer them uh, as directly as I can. Uh, I do not start with the assumption of genocide. I uh, base my use of the term on the independent legal analysis that was facilitated by the ICTJ. So from that point forward, I uh, characterize the events as genocide. That piggybacks on the legal conclusion, mm -hmm. on the applicability of the convention, not any prejudice or predisposition on my part. As far as Article 301 uh, being amended in 2008, uh, to my knowledge there are 107 journalists in Turkey that are now jailed for freedom of expression violations, either under Article 8, Article 301 of the Penal Code. I think that there are half a dozen other articles in the Penal Code that have been used to prosecute journalists. So I may have been mistaken in referring them to, uh, to Article 301, but clearly freedom of expression in Turkey is abridged. <coughs> On the question of uh, implementation, yes, there is a difference between ratification and implementation. Uh, even if Turkey had ratified, it could have walked back its commitment <coughs> at any time. Uh, are there international guarantees that could be used to make sure that treaty obligations are fulfilled? I think that's probably a question that uh, can be posed in a dozen different conflict situations. And that may be an area for study. Can one establish monitoring mechanisms that bring moral authority and political pressure to bear to get parties to fulfill their treaty obligations. And on the question of uh, timing, and there is a standard rule in negotiation that uh, one never operates under deadlines. There are also exceptions to that. George Mitchell negotiated the Good Friday Agreement by establishing a midnight deadline. And in the case of Turkey and Armenia, there were always action-causing events that brought the parties to a decision point, either the Remembrance Day anniversary or the World Cup qualifying matches precipitated action. Was 2008 a good time to launch this? I think you could probably say that uh, no time was a good time to launch it, given the deeply held views in opposition 
But by the same token, any time is a good time because both countries are well served through normalization and moving forward with their diplomatic relations as well. Thank you. Okay, we're running out of time. Um, Kate, Etienne has got her, had a hand up for a while. Uh, no, sorry. Um, no, no. Kate, that may have you behind you. Hi, Kate Nahapetian with the Armenian National Committee of America. Thank you for your presentation. I think a fundamental problem with the way the United States and other countries are dealing with this is that they're dealing with it as if it's a conflict between Armenia and Turkey and not a crime against humanity that other nations have a responsibility. Actually, the first time the term crime against humanity was used by nation states was to describe what happened to Armenians in the Ottoman Empire. And um, it, the solution isn't through mediation, it's through justice. And I wanted to, my question is, do you see an obligation by the United States and other countries that have signed on to the Genocide Convention to actually play an, a more integral role in solving this, uh, this genocide and not leaving it to just Armenia and Turkey? And two, on the Kars Treaty, if Turkey wants the Kars Treaty to be respected, they need to first respect it themselves. The Kars Treaty actually required that Turkey allow for the border between the Soviet Union and Turkey to be open and open for trade. They haven't been doing that for over 20 years. And um, when it comes to the efforts that you've been working on, there have been Turkish writers who are risking their, literally risking their lives to talk about the <coughs> Armenian Genocide in Turkey. I think they need a lot more support and I was wondering what kind of financial support or efforts are being made to support these voices that are so crucial in Turkey? Thank you. Okay, we're gonna get, I'll get in two more. I'm afraid we're going to have to close, but you've already got a microphone in your hand, sir. So. Uh, Mr. Phillips, my, my, my question just, is... Can you is just addressed. introduce yourself? Yeah. Uh, my name is Edgar Martirosian uh, with PFA. Uh, my question uh, is the following. We, we, have, we hear all this talk about commissions and, and, and truth-seeking and reconciliation, and I think at the basis of TARC and at the basis of any type of truth commission or any type of historical commission that we may have, uh, whether it be in the protocols or not, is seeking of truth. Well, if that is the predisposition, if that's what we want to get to, then why don't we encourage Turkey to establish a truth commission that functions like the truth commissions that came before it, which is completely internal, where Armenians don't take part in Just one question. Uh, Mr. Phillips, uh, can one uh, anticipate the future steps from either side? And who is going to kick the ball uh, of, uh, uh, during the second term of this football uh, diplomacy, soccer diplomacy? Usually soccer has two uh, halves, right? Uh, in this case, I think the, uh, the half may be half empty. Uh, the ball is in Turkey's court. Turkey is the greater power. The responsibility for the impasse rests with, in Ankara. Resolving it and moving forward is something that is well within the reach of Turkey, especially given the electoral mandate of the AKP in the last elections. Thank you very much.